So yesterday I published an article online uh, pretty much explaining why I think MCP is just not another API, why we couldn't have done what we're doing with MCP if the only thing that we had were regular uh, web APIs, okay? And I got a lot of responses, a lot of people talking to me about specifications and open API. So hopefully in this video, I'm gonna be able to do a couple of things. So number one, show you why they're not the same, why uh, MCP is different than just a regular API. And number two, show you a little bit more about how MCP works and why it's so, so cool. All right, so first of all, just to, to start this discussion, this is what a regular API looks like. This is what we're used to. We have an API that exposes functionality. In this case, we have products and orders and users, and we have a client that uses this API. Now imagine your code in this client, right? So in your application, you will make call to these fixed endpoints that the API offers, okay? So you will call products and you will provide whatever parameters the product endpoint expects. You're going to do all of that. But then tomorrow, you decide to change the API. So maybe you have too many products in the database, and now you want to add pagination to the API. And therefore, you change the interface. So now one required parameter for products is the number of products you want to return back. If you make that change in your API, you will also have to change the client. If you don't change the client, you will be breaking that client because the client is expecting a different contract. The contract that ties the client with the API changed. Therefore, you must change the client as well. And that is assuming that you control your client. But what happens if that API is popular? And there are a bunch of clients using that API. If you make a change in that API, what we call a breaking change, basically every single client will have to change as well, or they will just stop working. So that is why we had to introduce the concept of versioning when we're building APIs. So anytime you need to make a breaking change to your API, you have to create a new version, which is basically a complete new API. It's just different URL, Usually people include the version number in the URL just to change it, but that is a complete different API. That is fine. By the way, I'm not complaining about it. It's a little bit painful. I'm not complaining about it because that is fine for humans and systems to interact with APIs. But MCP is not trying to fix that problem. MCP is forward looking. MCP is trying to come in and solve this issue for an AI uh, let me call it dominated world, okay? And maybe dominated is not the right term here, but at least an AI first world. So what would this communication look like? That's where we get MCP. So let me try to explain, go through this uh, really quick so that makes sense. So in this case, we still have the client. Now I'm calling it an MCP client. And we still have the API, quote unquote, which I'm calling an MCP server. So basically the server will uh, provide some uh, functionality that the client can use. That's basically the way it works. So in this case, let's focus on the first one here, which are tools. So tools is, so think of tools like this slash products slash orders or capabilities that the server exposes. So I'm gonna show you one quick example here. Uh, it's just one tool that from the MCP server that I'm building is called invoke model. And this tool here expects a payload, and I'm using type hints to specify the format of this payload. I'm also using type hints to specify the format of the response uh, of the pay of this tool. And I'm using a doc string here in Python to tell whoever is gonna call this tool how to use it, what it does, what are the arguments, what are samples, of that argument and what uh, that caller should expect back. What is the meaning of that response? This is my tool. Notice that this tool here is self-describing. 
I don't need a separate file to explain what the tool does. I don't need another website. I, not, I don't need a URL with the documentation of my API. Everything else is together. Code and documentation, they are together. MCP is taking advantage of that, okay? So people talking about Swagger or Open API specification to explain, describe what APIs do, that's great that we use those. That's, I think Open API is amazing. It's just not this, it's something different. It requires a separate file. It requires people to do something very specific to get those APIs, uh, to describe those APIs. Remember, you can build an API with no documentation whatsoever, and that's totally fine. And therefore people do it, and they just don't put any documentation. In the AI space, if you want a tool to automatically use an API based on what it needs to do, you have to document that. And we are not just using a separate file, we're just using the, the ability to self-describe through code and type hints and whatnot. So because of that exists, now we can do cool things here. So look at this. When a client connects to a server for the first time, the client and the server will exchange capabilities, okay? So one of the first steps is the client connecting to the server, there's gonna be an exchange of capabilities powered by the protocol. That's the way it's gonna work, right? So in this exchange of capabilities, the server will tell the client, these are the tools that I support and how they work. So next time the agent that's hosting this client wants to do something, the agent can check those capabilities and decide whether it wants to call a server or not, okay? Because it's gonna have the entire documentation supported by the tools on that server. That exchange of capabilities happens immediately as soon as a client connects to the server. So going back to the previous example, let's imagine now that we need to make a change in one of those tools, okay? So now our get products tool requires a new parameter. Or if I go to my code here, the invoke model that right now receives a payload, imagine that tomorrow I want to also pass the URL, okay? So I'm gonna pass the URL that this invoke model expects, okay? So this is a change in the contract. However, because this is not an API and because calling this function is not hard coded like it was if I were calling an API, I do not need to change any clients. So the client, as soon as it connects to the server, the server will change an updated list of capabilities with new documentation. So it's gonna be self-healing from that point of view. I shouldn't say self-healing because it hasn't been broken before, but it basically dynamically will understand that there was change, okay? Dynamically will know how to connect using the new contract because that is baked into the protocol, okay? Can you do the same thing with an API? Well, sure, but somebody has to implement the ability of doing that, of checking the documentation, that's gonna be a separate URL from an API. Somebody has to check that documentation and do that interchange of capabilities. That doesn't exist. That's what MCP does for us. So let's go to the architecture here before I show you something extremely cool. In this architecture here, I think it's right here, you get uh, how the host, the client and the server will communicate with each other. So the host, that's, let's say, cursor, the IDE. The host will have a client and the client will have a server. So there's a one-to-one -one connection between clients and servers. So let's say you build your server. Uh, as soon as the host is ready to initialize the client that's gonna connect to that server, the client will go to the server and say, hey, I'm a client. I'm in charge of communicating with you. And these are my capabilities. The client has capabilities that we're gonna talk about in a second because they're super cool. And it's gonna announce those capabilities to the server. The server is gonna say, oh, awesome. These are my supported capabilities, okay? So the server will send back the tools that the server supports. It's more than tools. We're gonna talk about them in a second as well. But the server is gonna send back to the client the capabilities. This happens initializing a session. That's the first thing that happens. So anytime there are changes in that server, the next time you connect to it, all of this is gonna be 
fixed. Like now the host knows exactly how to use that server because the server told the host how to do so. So that is what happens here in order just to, to just activate a session, create a session for the first time. Now, notice that when I drew this particular chart, I drew a line with one direction, client talk to APIs. That's the way it works. But in the MCP page, I drew a bi-directional line. So that tells us something very, very cool, means that servers can also communicate with clients, specifically, or the one, I mean, support they support notifications, but the one that I want to talk about is sampling, because I think it's awesome, okay? So let's make an assumption, and let's say you're building a capability into the server, a tool that this server requires to use an LLM to do something, okay? Maybe the server is going to compute sentiment analysis on certain things, and it's going to use an LLM. Well, there are two ways building this. The normal way, normal way, uh, where the server maybe connects to uh, the OpenAI API and uses GPT-40 uh, just to, to fulfill that, that capability and then returns a response back to the client. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Or we can use sampling, and this is new in MCP. So what sampling means is that the server can ask the client, can you please run this query for me? Remember, all of this is running in the context of large language models, meaning there are large language models powering the whole thing here. That's how there is an agent that's deciding where to call, what tools to call. So of course there is a large language model. So what if, the server could request to the client, hey, I need to fulfill this thing. I need to run this query. Can you please use the LLM you already have access to and run it for me, okay? And even when the server does that, the server can specify which model to use in case the client has access to multiple models, like imagine cursor has access to, you know, Cloud 3.5, Cloud 3.7, ChatGPT has access to many models. Well, the server can tell the client, and can you please use GPT-40 if it's available? The client will then run that query and will send that response back to the server. So the communication in the MCP world happens bi-directionally. That's why this exchange of capabilities happens at the beginning of it. The client tells the server, hey, I support sampling. This is one capability that I support. The server tells the client, oh, by the way, I support all of these tools. And the server also supports resources, which is a different uh, ability that it's, is something new for this particular case. So resources or maybe URLs with documentation, uh, anything that you want to uh, give the client to extend the context in which a task is going to happen, you can include as a resource. Normally think of it as the local documents or URLs with documentation or GitHub files or anything on that sort or just physical resources that you want the client to have access to. You can expose those resources as capabilities on your server. You can also expose prompts. Like prompts is maybe in order to use that server, you need like templates to, you know, to better prompt or, or do something, you can give those prompts back to the client. You can tell the client, hey, by the way, here is a prompt. If you want to accomplish this, use this particular prompt. And the client can use that prompt now in order to make a specific call or whatnot. Now, all of this information that I just gave you, all of this information is part of the, the specification of the model context protocol. And it pisses me off that people make assumptions without reading it. So just, just take a look at it. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to show you here. If we go to, I think maybe client features uh, and you go to sampling, uh, one thing that I want to mention before I get a lot of people commenting uh, down there is that sampling server communicating with client should be gated with human in the loop. So we should put users in the middle because you know, you're gonna get this uh, yellow here for trust and safety and security. There should always be a human in the loop with the ability to deny sampling requests. And if you follow this sequence diagram, you notice that the server will uh, 
ask the client to, you know, to run a message, to run a query, the client will first present that request to a user. The user will have to approve it, okay? And then the client will send that approved request to the LLM. The LLM will generate a, a response. That response will get back to the client, not to the server, will get back to the client. The client will then show that response to the user again. So the user approves that response and then it sends that approved response back to the client right here. So that's sort of like the way this whole sampling idea works. Anyway, specification, the latest one, super cool. All of the definition, all of the ideas are right here. I personally think MCP has a lot of potential. A lot of people are already using it. A lot of people are building for it. A lot of companies are exposing functionality on their own MCP servers. There are Docker containers that you can download right now exposing different functionality. So if you need to do something with time or weather or whatnot, there are already uh, Docker containers that you can just download and connect to your uh, host application, Cursor, Windsurf, Replit, Cloud Desktop, whatever it is, to get access to that functionality. I do not know if this is gonna be big, I believe, I think it will be. I don't know if it's gonna happen, I've been wrong before, but I think this is awesome and it's something that's worth learning. So anyway, uh, thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.